and looking at the screen and I know nearly everybody <laughs> some of you have actually read the book so everything I say will be familiar to you um, I'm particularly pleased to see Wendy Captain who's the uh, curator of decorative arts at the Los Angeles County Museum because one of the things I'm talking about at the end is the new design for Los Angeles County Museum which is highly controversial and contentious and she can tell me if I'm right or wrong in what I say. say. Um, I'm going to talk not for so long uh, in order to give time for discussion um, partly because there are lots of people listening who are at least as knowledgeable about the subject as I am. So as Alistair said, I've been encouraged to talk about the work I've been doing over the last couple of years or so on the subject of new and recent art museums for a book which is entitled The Art Museum in Modern Times, which is going to be published, as he said, by Thames and Hudson, I hope, next March. It's just in the process of being laid out and designed by Harry Pierce Pentagram. So much as I look forward to comments, I fear I've now crossed the Rubicon in terms of being able to make changes to do that. So as Ellis said, having worked in museums and galleries pretty well all my adult life, and now having retired from the Royal Academy of Arts as its section and chief executive at the end of 2018, I wanted to have an opportunity to stand back, look at, and think about what had changed in terms of the design of museums during the time since I first joined the BA in 1982. Something which one is never really able to do in a properly systematic way when one is in full time employment, responsible for the day to day operation of an organization, which at the Royal Academy involved the conversion of Burlington Gardens by David Chipperfield. In the first version of the text, which I finished this time last summer, I included a certain amount of semi-autobiographical material about the experiences of working in different types and styles of museums, including a chapter on the v &A where I worked till 1994. But I realized from the reaction of the group of friends who read it, two of whom are listening this evening, over last summer, that nobody much liked it. It was maybe too much of a hybrid between a book about what new museums look like, how and why they're designed in the way that they are, and a completely different book about the politics and pressures of working in museums and how and why their policies have changed. So last November, I unceremoniously dumped all the semi-autobiographical stuff in order to be able to concentrate on what I regard as the core cool narrative how and why museums look so different over time, how and why they're designed in such different styles, what one might be able to learn about the nature and character of museums from an examination and analysis of these differences in construction and intent. In the majority of the text, I write about the history of new museums, starting with the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1939 on screen ending with the new branch of the Centre Pompidou, which opened in the West Bone in Shanghai last November. I wrote about each of the museum projects singly, rightly or wrongly, without a very clear idea of what the overall narrative would turn out to be. So far as I was concerned, I was writing the book precisely in order to find out what the narrative has been. Because although there's a big secondary literature, on the history of individual museums. Much of it is purely celebratory, written at the time a new museum opens. And I felt that the literature has made relatively little, and sometimes no effort, to think about the ways in which new museums express and reflect more general ideas and beliefs as to what a museum should be. For the purposes of this evening's talk, I thought I would focus on the final section of the book, which I've called The Museum Reinvented, and the concluding chapter, which is called, maybe slightly pretentiously, Key Issues for the Contemporary Museum, because this is the part which I wrote most recently, towards the end of last year and this spring, which I found most tricky, and which, to be honest, 
I'm most nervous about as to how it will be received. You're basically the first people to hear any of it, and I'd be very grateful for your response. Although, as I've said, it's too late to make changes to the text, other than obvious correction. So I started the last section on the museum reinvented with the Museum of New and Old Art outside Hobart in Tasmania, which I went to on a day trip in late January, not long before lockdown. It was a mad thing to have done. But it's an amazing building on a small promontory on the River Derwent, northwest of Hobart. So you're meant to reach by a special boat, which has a bar on board to get you in the right mood. If you arrive by boat, you see the museum spread out low, close to the waterside, as you see on screen, a deliberately anti-monumental set of structures, halfway between a fortress and a theme park designed by Nanda Katsalidis, who's one half of the practice Fender Katsalidis, which had pre previously done an extension to the Bendigo Museum of Art outside Melbourne, and the Ian Potter Museum of Art, which houses the collections of the University of Melbourne. That's the uh, Potter Museum of Art, which I haven't seen. Mona is quite an amazing experience, not so much externally, where it's deliberately casual, a bit ad hoc, with a set of somewhat random court end structures and a tennis court, uh, as internally. You go down in a lift to the basement, and there in front of you is a long bar and a very elaborate machine for the sale of the locally brewed beer. Before you is a sheer wall carved out of the rock face. You go along this, not quite sure where you're going or what you're doing, until you come to a big square underground space, which has an artwork projected onto the wall, which spells out iconic words. It's deliberately the opposite to a normal museum experience. It's underground, not overground. You haven't a clue what to expect. It's willfully disoriented, a cavern of wonders, rather than an encyclopedia of treasures. There's no obvious route round the museum, but a set of spiraling staircases, like an Asher drawing. You do not need to read or be told that this is thought of as an anti-museum, subverting every aspect of the traditional museum, is upending. There's no narrative, no sense whatever of being educated. It's all about a sense of exploration and visceral subliminal experience. Now you could say that Mona is an oddity, a deliberate freak, as its owner David Walsh, who made his fortune through gambling, would like it to be. Uh, that's by Andres Serrano. I wasn't allowed to include it in the book, so I'm including it now. Um, it, uh, there were worries that it would diminish the sales in the Far East. But the more I worked on the trajectory of museums over the last decade, the more I felt that far from being a freak, it encapsulated a set of trends which are evident in other recent museums and is a harbinger of things to come. So let me now look at the two versions of Tate Modern. We'll get rid of uh, David Walsh and get to Tate Modern on the screen. Um, as represented first by the conversion of Giles Gilbert Scott's Great Bankside Power Station by Herzog and de Muren in the late 1990s. And then second, uh, which of course you see behind, uh, the so-called Blavatnik building by the same architects, which opened on the 17th of June, 2016. Actually, I particularly like this photograph because it shows the, um, two, the juxtaposition between the two buildings. The first Tate Modern was in some ways revolutionary, such big scale, opening up London to contemporary art and culture, mixing up the permanent collection with the great experience of big installations in the turbine hall. Using grand post-industrial space for the display of art with rough floors and views out across the river. But it was in some ways traditional, in that as you came through the entrance from the west, into the turbine hall, 
you were expected to know and understand the layout of the building and the nature of the experience which was in store, with still a sense of a traditional hierarchy in the way that the building was laid out. If we have the next uh, image. Uh, the bookshop is in the basement of the stack, then a cafe on the ground floor, an escalator taking up, you up to what was still regarded as the central part of the experience. Two floors of galleries and one for exhibitions, all, all arranged logically and systematically. There's the uh, um, floor plan up there. There was even apparently, I can't remember who told me when it first opened, although it was scrubbed out almost immediately, a copy of Alfred Bauer's famous diagram of the movements of art to guide the visitor around the collection. The Blavatnik building is pretty much the opposite. You never quite know where you are in the building. It's dominated by this large monumental staircase, which takes you up in such a way that you never quite know where the next floor is going to be. In drawing up plans for the Tate's expansion in 2004, before they'd actually won the competition to design it, Herzog and de Meuron drew a diagram which showed alongside the original Tate Modern, which they described as enfilade and turbine hole, pictures of two of their own projects from, for, for, for private collectors. The Schaulager in the outskirts of Basel, which is a large scale warehouse for the storage and display of a private collection of art and the Kramnik residence and collection in Napa Valley, uh, California, which includes a subterranean home for a media art collection. They describe their project as what they call lofts and caves. And I think this is a good encapsulation of what they were trying to do with the extension, scrambling the existing geometry, making the experience much less predictable and less legible, so that the visitor does not know quite what to expect, but finds it out through exploration. That may not be legible, it's an attempt to show the difference between the um, original Tate Modern and the ground plan of the Blavatnik building. A third of my recent case studies is the Museum Sush, right up in the mountains of Switzerland, in a remote pilgrimage village, which has a population of about 300 which one reaches by a long train journey from Zurich. Again, some of the characteristics are evident, which I think are increasingly common in new museums. One arrives at the railway station above the village, not knowing quite what to expect. There's no sign of the museum in the village below. Not surprisingly, because it's been converted out of existing buildings, including the town brewery, by two Swiss architects, Jasper Schmidlin, who grew up in the region, and Lucas Wollmi, have created an experience which, comparable to the others I've discussed, involves a sense of exploration, burrowing underground into the rockwork, treating the artworks not as things to be admired and contemplated, but as works to be found and enjoyed with a frisson of discovery. Schmidlin was interviewed by Archinect before the project opened and described how we work towards a minimal, quiet architecture, emphasizing the pearls of the site, which already carry a strong character. For example, the stone cave is completely out of the existing rock. The architecture is a non-ego architecture, working with the landscape and the spaces in between to create a self-evident place for art. Does not need me to say how very different and probably self consciously different this is to the majority of post war museums. It's a turn away from the monumental and heroic architecture of the 1990s, as represented by the Getty Museum and the Guggenheim, Bilbao, into an architecture which is much lower key, much less obviously heroic, much more deferential to the works of art themselves. Now, it's obviously hard to generalize from a very small number of case studies. For every example, as a counterexample, it's difficult to argue for a move towards the anti heroic and anti monumental 
when one thinks of such gas-guzzling giants as Jean Nouvel's Louvre Abu Dhabi, which is on a simply colossal scale, with a big roof like a globe shining white. Actually, the globe isn't white, the rest of the museum is white, on the outskirts of the city. Or indeed, if one thinks of the other museums, and for Sadayat Island, just north of the city of Abu Dhabi, the Zaid National Museum, designed by Norman Foster. Now, do you uh, read to open in 2021? And Frank Gehry's astonishing building for the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. So, looking at these, it's hard to argue that the age of the heroic, monumental, and commemorative museum project is over. But having said it's hard to generalize, I'm going to try and do just that, as I have in the book, to try to make sense of the mood of moves in recent museum projects. The first thing, which I think is obvious, in is the number of recent museum projects, which are not completely new projects, but reinventions of existing ones. In the book, I've included the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia, which consists of a reconstruction of the original Barnes Foundation, uh, which was built in Marion County, the smart suburbs of Philadelphia, where the neighbors didn't want too many visitors to the Paul Crep Design Neoclassical Museum. It's now been transferred to downtown Philadelphia, where it can attract tourists on their way to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, so you saw Todd Williams and Billy Tsin, who um, outside the museum, and then slightly bizarrely, but necessarily in order to observe the terms of the original bequest, they've simply reconstructed um, pretty accurately, although to be honest, it feels very different. I think because it's brand new, um, the interior rooms of the original Barnes Foundation. So the original gallery layout has been reconstructed as exactly as possible um, to uh, with, with space alongside it to accommodate all the things which museums are now expected to have. There's a basement cafe, a smart restaurant, exhibition galleries, in the center of the building, a slightly surprising large vacant hall, which is intended as milling space, public forum, and then of course doubles in the evening as entertainment space, as an additional source of income. The new Whitney in New York, if we can have the Whitney on the screen, is likewise not exactly a brand new project, but a reinvention of the old uptown Whitney at Whitney, downtown in the meatpacking district, south of Chelsea, just next door to the bottom of the High Line. This project does seem to me to be entirely emblematic of recent changes in museums. The old Whitney Museum, designed by Marcel Breyer, was highly introverted. It's different in style and character from its surroundings, as it was possible for it to be, declaring its originality and bristling with modernist architectural integrity. Whereas the new Whitney Museum, uh, next slide, blends into its surroundings relatively unobtrusively, a series of open decks for the display of art with viewing platforms which relate the museum to the surrounding city. The third recent project, which is also essentially a reinvention of an existing arts institution, it's the new Burlington Gardens building, which acts as an extension of the Royal Academy, providing it with all the things which it needed and did not have. The grand public lecture theater, which you see on the screen, space for the display of its collection, which it previously didn't have. Another set of exhibition galleries for the display of contemporary art. Sorry, it's so minimal. Um, it's not actually a very good image. Uh, but also, not just designated spaces for specific activities, but more public space, space to walk, explore, and linger. What I, I was told is done by sociologists of architecture as fourth space, that is space which does not have a designated function, but is free public space, important to the experience of architecture. The second general theme of the book, which is obvious, is the rise of the private museums. 
The construction of museums used to be the responsibility of city and national government. They were treated as instruments of public education alongside schools and libraries, were often constructed in the centre of the city as urban monuments or at the edge of the city as places of public recreation. But from Louisiana onwards, built beyond the suburbs of Copenhagen by Knut Trentzen, made money out of soft cheese, many of the innovations and new developments in museums have been the initiative of entrepreneurs and philanthropists, as in Mona in Hobart, which is a self-conscious and deliberate breach with the traditions of the museum, made possible by the money which its owner, David Walsh, had made from gambling and the Museum Sush in, in Switzerland, which is purely a product of private initiative on the part of Gracina Kulczyk, a, a, a Polish entrepreneur and businesswoman, who decided to construct her museum in Switzerland rather than in Poland, after the Polish authorities apparently repeatedly rejected her desire for collaboration either in her home city of Poznan or in Warsaw. The, of Sana in the 21st Century Museum of Contemporary Art in Kanazawa in northern Japan, and the new Louvre in Lens. These are lightweight, single height structures which float on the ground rather than expressing their seriousness through the construction of solid walls. They're magical, slightly ethereal buildings which express an idea of the building of, of the museum as being tentative and exploratory, rather than narrative and definitive. So, as I said at the beginning, I'm going to end my discussion of themes and uh, introductory discussion of themes and trends in new museums by looking at the new Blackman in Los Angeles, which has been designed by Peter Zumthor, which has proved, as you probably know, to be incredibly controversial. I think because it exemplifies in a very clear form many of the recent trends in museums and by encapsulating them has enraged the more conservative architectural critics in Los Angeles by its obvious breach with tradition and overturning of the traditional expectations and responsibilities of museums. First, a decision was made that it would be too expensive to renovate the existing structures of the museum. Let's have the original image of the original museum, uh, which were felt to have lived past their period of natural usefulness and are in styles which are currently very unfashionable. Although, as often happens, the moment that a decision is made to destroy a building is just the moment when the pendulum swings and the style of which the original building and the style of the original building comes back into fashion. The original 1960s building were by William L. Perara and Associates, were in a civic, civic campus style. I think they also did the Lincoln Center. In the 1980s, major additions were made by Hardy Holtzman Pfeiffer in a style of slightly Hollywood postmodernism to connect the museum more to the street with a grand ceremonial entrance. Actually, let's go back to the Hardy Holtzman paper. When Michael Govan became director in 2006, he brought with him an ambition to work with Peter Zumthor, famously does not accept any commissions through open competition, nor if any restrictions are placed on the budget, which is potentially either extraordinarily brave for a public museum or very risky. In practice, it's probably been both. Zumthor was happy to sweep away the existing structures in order to create a building, we'll, we'll have the next uh, image, uh, which is nearly diametrically the opposite to what traditional museums have been. A single depth swooping structure, which looks a bit like a bird from the air and which deliberately condenses the existing displays of the collection, uh, which traditionally have been displayed according to chronology and place of origin into more thematic temporary installations, which I think are likely to resemble an exhibition much more than a traditional uh, permanent collection, aimed, aimed essentially at the general public and not at the specialists. 
I think it'll be interesting to see what the public reaction is to the new LACMA when it opens in 2023. I'm sure that it will continue to be highly controversial because it's such an obvious and in some ways ostentatious manifestation of so many recent trends in museum building, away from the idea of con constructing a public narrative concerned with a linear and systematic history towards somewhere which is more piecemeal, somewhere to experience not so much a public history as much more works of contemporary art, somewhere where the art is mediated by interpretation rather than left to stand on its own, somewhere which, as Michael Govan describes it, is less like an encyclopedia and more like a poem, tentative and provisional rather than logical and systematic. So these are some of the overall themes of the book, which, as I've already said, is going to be published under the title The Art Museum in Modern Times Next Spring. As I said at the beginning, you're the first people on whom I've tried out some of the themes of the overarching narrative. I find it genuinely helpful to have your questions and response. Not, as I've said, that I can now change the text, which has already been laid out, but in order to judge whether or not and how far the narrative is either too obvious or potentially contentious, both of which views have been suggested by the few people who have read it so far. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Fantastic. Um, yeah, if, if we have, um, uh, I can see already, well, in the, in the room we have uh, the architects of some very distinguished galleries so it would be good to, <laughs> good to hear from some of them um, but for all of you if you if you just uh, alert me in the chat box uh, that you'd like to ask a question uh, then I will um, pass you the, the, the um, microphone as it were. Um, could I begin though by, by just asking um, Charles if you had a um, you know, I think Mark Pimlot has written about um, I.M. Pei's work at the Louvre as really being a, um, a landmark in the development of the museum um, as, a, as it moves towards being a site of mass tourism uh, away from uh, essentially a 19th century model in which um, I remember say, David Chipperfield talking about that the, the um, 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 Neuss Museum in Berlin, where you would originally have uh, rang the bell and the curator would have come and let you in, and it was a, um, a sort of much of an individual experience as opposed to the the, the kind of um, experience we expect we expect from a museum today. I still find it extraordinary going to take modern the um, that there are people in such numbers coming to that that institution, given the. Um, how limited the audience for modern art seemed to be in the in the decade prior to that in in, in the UK. Do, do you sense this um, this read this transformation of the museum into being a site of public representation and public tourism? Is that is that a trend that um, is it unstoppable? Do you think there will be a resistance to that? I think there's some resistance. I mean, I think something like the Museum Sush does represent a bit of a resistance. I mean, in the 80s and 90s, you get these huge, great, very ambitious urban projects, which were as much about international tourism as they were really about the experience of the museum. I mean, the IMP pyramid, people think only of the pyramid, but really it was a massive reconstruction of the entrance facilities, basically doing what an incredible number of the projects I look at have to do, which is to install the facilities which tourists now expect into 19th or in the case of the Louvre much earlier, buildings which were tricky in terms of public access, didn't have shops, didn't have exhibition galleries, didn't have catering. And so that the IMP building, everybody thinks of the pyramid as if the pyramid was what the project was about, but it's really about excavating the ground underneath in order to have better public access from the metro. And so 
I mean, as, 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 what, what I find odd is because I did each of the projects one by one, actually, as you can probably tell, constructing what the overall narrative I have found tricky because there's no absolutely consistent narrative. What, what I've tried to do in the final section is to draw out themes, one of which is, I think, a move away from these very dominant buildings. I mean, you know, there was the Bilbao effect, and then there was the anti-Bilbao effect. And uh, Zumthor's Columba was pretty self-consciously anti-Bilbao. It's more about the experience of the collection and not about big monumental architecture. But as I say, the, 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 the problem with trying to say that there's a coherent and consistent narrative is that there are always examples which it's easy to cite, which are the opposite. So that what, what Abu Dhabi is doing in Sadat Island is a version, a rather extreme version of what the um, regional government was trying to do with Bilbao. So, so, so what, what I'm trying to do is construct sort of general trends based on a relatively small number of examples. And to what, ex um, to what extent are these developments led by curatorial concerns or curatorial interests? And to what extent is this a narrative about um, architects and responding to um, yeah, uh, respond, responding to the, the to, other, to other buildings. It, it's a bit of both. I'm actually, if I'm honest, the curators themselves are not very evident in determining the brief. Uh, except, interestingly, I mean, I'm very admiring of Columba. Funny enough, I'm partly admiring because it's very, very unusual as a recent museum project. You would have thought that with the existence of the internet, it would be relatively easy to do the research which is necessary to find out about these projects. But actually, I've found the internet is oddly unhelpful because most of the museum's communications team, and they tend not to be interested or want to have too much about the history. But with Columba, they've published online the entire narrative of the gestation of the institution, including very thoughtful lectures, not only by the museum director, but by two of the people who were working on it. And there you see it is driven by a belief in trying to do, to present the collection differently. But the reason I think it's interesting is that it's actually quite unusual. I mean, Wendy Kaplan, who's on, on the line, who's been involved with LACMA, LACMA, I would see, is in essence a top-down project where Michael Goben, as director, came in with a set of ideas and beliefs which he had developed. I mean, he worked for Tom Krenz on Bilbao, and then he did the, I think, wonderful project at Deer Beacon, so that some of what I think he has been trying to do is adapt a traditional city museum to ideas which came more from um, the Guggenheim and, and Dear Beacon, which are private museums. And uh, the, the buildings that you looked at, were you able to offer, were, were there some that you felt had actively failed in their attempts to uh, make good spaces for art? Um, I selected, I mean, the selection is a bit arbitrary. I've selected ones I'm interested in, and I'm interested in, because it's actually quite tricky, even for a retired museum director, to be very, trick, uh, very critical of the work of former colleagues, and e even if I'd wanted to be, which I didn't predict it. I mean, the book is an attempt to try and, in my own terms, understand and describe based on visiting them. I mean, it's not a work of deep research. It's based on visiting them and exploring as far as I can what they thought they were trying to do. And it's not critical in that way. It may, it may be, be criticised itself for not being critical enough. 
Um, let's have some questions from some other people. Uh, um, Claire Wright uh, is here. Uh, Claire, I can... Yep. Yeah, Claire, you've got the microphone. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I was just typing it out. Well, one of the things that I thought was really interesting in the building was in the in your book was that um was that each museum was treated as an individual in its own right rather than being classified there was actually some there was actually someone who and i can't remember who it was would you give an account of an architect who objected to being classified in some ways i think i well i can completely sympathize with that because i think for architects, designing is so personal and they don't even realise that they're part of a trend very often. But I actually thought that made it more interesting that you, you, you gave an account of each of the museums and then gradually one began to see the themes that you then later described. I thought that was extremely interesting. And do you know what I mean? Rather than grouping them together as the ones that were... Um, well, with the Bobao effect or the ones that were uh, more self-effacing and modest or more preoccupied with how you, how you exhibit the material. But I am quite interested in Ellis's point about Tate Modern because it is, it is quite phenomenal that Tate Modern is so popular with, a, with the public generally. And the, it does seem to be about the building. More yeah, than... I mean... I, I mean... Funny enough, Tate Modern is the one I'm most sensitive about the way I've described. Uh, just because I think in this country, you're, you're, you're in a way not allowed to be critical of it. It's assumed, which I, I think it's gigantically successful. Mm. Um, but the fact is, Exactly as you say, it is about the experience of the building and the turbine hall. And in the Blavatnik building, I mean, the Blavatnik building is not really about exhibition galleries or the display of the collection. I think a lot of it was to provide facilities which they hadn't been able to do um, mm. in, in the first phase. And I think one of the things I hadn't realized is that they moved immediately from Tate Modern 1, if you call it that, to Tate Modern 2, seamlessly. That there was no sense in which they finished the first project and then they analysed its success mm -hmm. or otherwise and then embarked on a second one in order to do whatever the first one hadn't done. Um, they were already discussing what should happen and what needed to be done they were already in, in discussion with whatever it was, British nuclear fuels who owned the building. The, um, the electricity station was beginning to retreat. And so Nick saw the opportunities. And mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know the circumstances of the second competition, but I very well remember that in the first competition, it was a huge, great public thing. Um, all the, all the designs were exhibited. There was a public discussion about who the architect should be, but the second competition, there will have had to have been a competition because there was so much public money involved. But as, as you see from what, what I described, Herzog and Demuren were already describing what their ambitions were in 2004, the longest paper about what they thought should happen antedated the competition. So that presumably the competition itself uh, was probably a bit of a foregone conclusion. Oh, yeah. Mm. But, but oh. what what you said what you said first is is either the strength or the weakness of the book. I mean, I hope the strength is that I've tried to treat each of the projects on its own terms and credit it for doing what it was trying to do, rather than fit it to an overall narrative but then the weakness and why I was sort of trying to concentrate on the issues of the overall narrative is that most people like books to have a narrative and to know what the conclusion is and actually I neither wrote it with a clear sense what the narrative was going to be uh, nor did I write it as a track you know I, I wanted to explore the different mm. types of styles and museums on their own terms rather than as part of part of a Kind of, you should be doing this. Well, that, that was very. 
I liked about it. Well, we'll see what other people think. <laughs> Um, a question from Adrian Ellis. Adrian, I'm unmuting you. Uh, thanks. It, um, well, it was more just a chat observation. Hi, Charles. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, yeah. um, Adrian's one of the people who's read. Now, you re Adrian read an earlier draft. No, I was... Adrian was probably one of the people who made me rewrite it. Well, not not, not by what he said, but by what he didn't say. Yeah, not at all. But um, just an observation: wasn't there a wasn't there a period I would say um, when advances in CAD CAM, materials science, everything else, um, uh, structural engineering, there was a period of sort of giddiness when pretty well anything that you thought of, you could you suddenly discovered that you could build, and museums were a, a great sort of canvas for that because for two reasons: first, they are you know, big one-off bespoke spaces with volumes. And the other is that the client body is kind of naive and enjoys, it enjoys that space. You know, you know, it's not like you're designing a prison and the, and the client is constantly thinking, you know, what are, what are the functional um, attributes of it? And, you know, how do I standardize this? As clients, the museum, museum professions usually think the opposite, which is how can I make this as unstandard as possible and distinctive as possible? So there was a period when we sort of, you know, when a lot of those those very high profile, very uh, um, highly expressive buildings were what the game was about. And then it sort of passed because just because you can do it doesn't mean that you want to do it. And other, you know, functionality sort of reasserted itself. Uh, and so some of those more polite recessive buildings with greater functionality are, are, as it were, the next generation. And when you're looking maybe at the Abu Dhabis, they are still a legacy of, you know, they're, 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 they're still the legacy of, of that, that initial rush towards highly expressive architecture that, that new techniques allowed. Just a thought. Yeah, no, I, I think that's correct. I mean, as with a lot of the book, I was reading stuff for the first time. So like the uh, Guggenheim Bilbao, was, I think, an unbelievably important project. Uh, and in many ways, a very, very successful one. And that was very much made possible by CAD. Except that Gary actually did it all through drawings to begin with. It was just that back in Los Angeles, in his office, they had the ability to convert these rather freehand, freestyle drawings. Uh, into a constructed building because of the existence of new, new, new technology. So it's sort of obvious that what Gary was doing was made possible by, by new, new engineering and new computer-aided design. What I, I haven't included, and I, you know, if I'd been consistent and systematic, I should have included Zaha's museum in Rome, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but I've not actually seen it. <laughs> Um, but I, uh, my sense from sort of inside the profession, it was her museum in Rome, which turned, but oddly enough, it, it won the Sterling Prize. It won the Sterling Prize, I think, in the year that Chipperfield's uh, Norris Museum uh, was the, the rival. Um, so that it's been successful architecturally, but I think, I sense most people in the profession um, think it's unsuccessful in terms of the display of the collection. So all, all, all the way through, you get the tension between the architect. I mean, the Guggenheim in New York, the first director I discovered from the exhibition, which was in Lisbon and is, uh, I think, just opened in Rotterdam about museum display, the first director at the Guggenheim went off to the annual conference of ICOM and got ICOM to pass a motion, a public motion, that no museum would ever be allowed to be put in the hands of the architect on their own ever again. That, and, and that's an indication of, of the tension which runs all the way through the book of kind of client, um, curators, architects. And um, in each project, there's a slightly different chemistry between those three. Yeah, I should say, cloud museum director, curator, architect. If if somebody is 
contemplating a capital project and they're on the curatorial side, there is nothing better than reading the correspondence between Frank Lloyd Wright and the Guggenheim uh, uh, client body. It is the most um, wheedling, manipulative, overbearing. It gives you some, some <laughs> you know, insight into, you know, into how those, how those relationships work. On the other hand, you know, you might say that's a, a, an iconically successful building and has, has allowed all sorts of, um, you know, um, uh, possibilities that a more conventional approach wouldn't have allowed. You know, I'll shut up. Yeah, for those who don't know it, the, the entire correspondence has been published. And as Adrian says, it's incredibly revealing. The, the other thing, the book, I mean, while we're on the subject of the secondary literature, which I found very, very rewarding, is there was a book published called Power Into Art about the gestation of Tate Modern, the first Tate Modern, which was done by the person who was commissioned to do a television program about it. And because he was doing the television program, he was at all the meetings as an observer. And he recorded and documented them because the cameras were running. And then he produced a book. Nobody has ever told me to read it, but actually, I found it one of the most rewarding descriptions of the difficulties and tensions which arise when you're doing a big museum project because it's sort of inevitable. You, you, they, they, they don't run smoothly. Well, in my experience, they don't run smoothly. <laughs> um, Charles, is there a, um, I mean, we talked, touched on Maxi just then, which I agree is sort of, I mean, the rhetoric when, when the building was, was unveiled was that uh, um, that artists would appreciate having a building that was very specific architecturally, which uh, they would respond to. And um, I guess the Guggenheim is a building, the, the original Guggenheim, but certainly a building of that kind of nature as well. There's, there's a sort of um, uh, a challenge kind of um, put, put down to, to, to artists. Do you do you have any? Do you believe that that, as a strategy, is a ever a, uh, a productive one? I, I mean, like Adrian, I think the Guggenheim in New York is a very exciting project, and and some museum people are very critical of the Guggenheim Bilbao for exactly the same reason. It's kind of big on architectural effect. And it's not really intended to be or expected to be. I mean, it was originally, the idea was that it would show the Guggenheim's collection. And there are some relatively conventional exhibition, square, rectangular exhibition galleries in it. But nobody really goes, they may go for exhibitions, but I don't think anybody thinks of the Guggenheim Bilbao as an outstation of the Guggenheim's collection. They view it as somewhere which is a public spectacle. And, and a very successful one. So that, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not with those people who are very critical of either the Guggenheim in New York or the Guggenheim Bilbao because they're somehow not museums. They are a version of the museum which are very successful on their own terms, even if those terms exclude uh, a conventional display of, uh, of a collection. That, that's why I think LACMA, what's happening in LACMA, uh, uh, it's very interesting because it's within this lineage of projects which are led by an architect and will probably be very excited, perceived as very exciting and adventurous as a work of arch architecture because uh, um, sometimes a great architect. But like, like the Guggenheim in New York and, and, and Bilbao will be seen as very strong in architecture in an architectural way and is already seen, for perfectly understandable reasons, as not showing the collection in as much depth as it was previously displayed in the old 1960s buildings. And that's because the idea of what a museum should be has essentially changed. But, um, I mean, to take, kind of, uh, I guess, to take modern turbine hall or the interior and maxi, are both, I think, examples of spaces that demand and, and have generated a new kind of art just by sheer force of the kind of scale of the spaces. Um, I remember Rem Coolhouse complaining about the fact that every 
installation that gets made in the um, the Tate Modern Turbine Hall has this apocalyptic kind of uh, um, undertow to it. But but there's I think it's an instance of a well the the nature of art has changed in response to those those spaces. Um, I mean of the of the, of the projects you well. How, how do you feel about that 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 relationship? You know, the, the uh, between between arch, 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 architecture as a generator of kinds of uh, developments in, in art production. Well, w one of the concluding sections, not one of the ones I talked about this evening, is called the changing characteristics of works of art, because it's completely obvious that traditional museums. I mean, if you go back to 1939 when the new museum opened. Uh, um, Alfred Bauer was very keen on it having design and sculpture, but still painting was central and somehow design and photography, even now, are not really central. It's still, you know, walls of a gallery and the majority of work is expected to be hung on the walls. I, I, I see the, this kind of change, the break, um, I think, as being really dear beacon just because the Deer Foundation in the 70s sponsored and supported the huge great projects of land art um, uh, out in Arizona. And once you, once you have those huge great installations, then they can't be accommodated by traditional museums. And then you get the explosion and change in the nature of the museum. So that um, I, I do see sort of, uh, I mean, again, I don't know how valid it is, but Tom Krenz was in Williams. Uh, he was the director of the Williams Art Museum in the 1980s. Michael Govan was a pupil of his and worked with him in Williams and then again in New York. And Tom Krenz had this idea of, doing Mass Mocha, and Mass Mocha influenced Tate Modern because it's the idea of taking over existing industrial buildings and using them for the display of grand, big, uh, um, mega art. So that, uh, again, you know, that, that there are narratives within the text which may be, may be well known to people, but they weren't well known to me. Um, some more questions. Um, Anna Dempster, I'm going to unmute you. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, I was sort of struck um, when, the, when you described uh, some of the case studies, all of which are fascinating and very diverse, which makes them, I think, even more interesting, um, about these moments of, you know, of sort of classical conspicuous consumption. You know, so the, you, the, the boat has a bar, you arrive in the museum, there's another bar, there's this kind of wow moment. And there's a lot of, um, it feels like there's a lot of opportunities to consume different things, but all to do with the experience of consumption rather than the kind of purely educational learning part that you might expect. Is that a trend or is that something that has always existed you know, for and, and has been linked to, um, you know, cultural experiences. I, I, well, I wasn't sure. Well, as was probably obvious, I really love Mona. I thought it was incredibly exciting. Um, <laughs> and in a way, I think it was designed to irritate and annoy people like me because it is entirely counter and deliberately counter to all the orthodoxies of what museums are expected and designed and planned to be. But at the same time, I think on its own terms, it's very successful. And I mean, I'm still very annoyed because I only went there for half a day. And actually, it turns out that you can stay there overnight at a cost. And then that's probably what helps some stays here. And I, as you probably guessed, I didn't actually go on the boat. And going on the boat is part of the experience. And actually, I, I think it is a very intelligent um, reaction and response to what people want museums to be now. In other words, they don't, they don't want to be told, they don't want to be sitting in a schoolroom. 
they want to be able to explore for themselves. It, I find Mona, I mean, it might sound as if I'm being critical, but actually the way it displays art and shows art and the quality of the collection itself, I thought was deeply serious. Uh, David Walsh has been a very adventurous collector of, of contemporary art in a, in a very sort of strongly individual way. And he's collected work which is about experience. And as a result, you don't only get the sense of it's a nice place to go for a day out or, you know, for an overnight stay or part of the tourist leisure industry in Tasmania. I mean, it brings, I, I think it gets 750,000 visitors. I can't remember what the population of Hobart is. It's a huge engine for the economy of Tasmania. But at the same time, I thought and felt that it was very serious as, a, as in a way, a conventional museum. 